Williams, and we welcome you again to Love and Lordship Live. Thanks for joining us and for sharing it and for spreading the word. A lot of good things happening. We're getting uh, 2,000 views of these every week now. We're just putting them out a little bit, and, and I think the Lord's continuing to grow that, and we'd ask you to keep that in prayer. Um, I truly believe it's the Lord and His Word and His Spirit, and we know when we're faithful of that, it will not return void that it's going to do what he wants it to do and accomplish what he wants it to accomplish. So we're walking in faith in that. We thank you for your involvement. So thank you those who are joining and, and uh, invite others to join us right now. Appreciate that. Now, now last week, again, we're not going to spend too much more time on this pandemic. It's starting to pass and it's going to pass. It's probably going to come back again some way and, and we're just going to deal with it. But we don't have to worry about it because the Lord is on our side. And we need to walk in that kind of faith. So we moved on last week and started this series called The Story or the Tale of Two Kingdoms. That there really are only two kingdoms. And we're going to find out here in the next week or two that one of the greatest, probably the greatest deception is that there's another kingdom and it's yours. We don't want to fall for that last. So that's why we lay this foundation of understanding that there are only two, which means there are only two kings and two lords. We better know whose kingdom we're in. And so this week we're going to go a little deeper in that by connecting authority. Remember, said authority is not lording over or controlling. It's knowing the author so we can walk in his truth. And that's what we want to connect, authority and truth. All right? So this is the second part of this series. And we, we need to understand that if we're going to do this, we all need to be on the same page or on the same foundation. It's, it's literally that foundation that will reflect the author's truth, and which author's truth you're listening to. Two kingdoms, right? We need to know whether or not we are following the truth of the author, Christ the King, the Lord, the author has been given all authority, or if by chance we don't know it, but we're in the other kingdom. And it's hard to hear that, but it's true according to Scripture. In other words, listen to this, that foundation always will reflect the author or the authority and his truth in our lives. The foundation, good or bad, is rooted in whose Lord or authority in your life and who you are a disciple of. So the question is, who is your Lord? I, I, I write this, whenever I write it, you'll see it in the comments and, and in any of the articles you read at www.loveandlordship.com. You'll see that I constantly, when I'm talking about lordship, who's your Lord, uh, who you're a disciple of, I always give a capital L Lord and then a slash and then a lowercase L Lord. Is it Christ or is it the enemy? We need to be clear on that. And we tend to think that if I've stood up in front of a church and I've said I believe and I got baptized, that, that, that I know who my Lord is. Jesus tells us, and we're going to find out over the next few weeks in this series, what it means to, for him to be Lord and for us to be a disciple. And it's, it, he gives us that free gift there, but, it, but he puts us in that relationship with him that goes far beyond that. And so we want to start here on the right foundation, and that's what we're doing. The question is, do you know who your Lord is? Do you know who you are a disciple of? Because whoever is your Lord, knowingly, the one you know knowingly or perhaps unknowingly, is the one you are claiming as author and you're following his truth. That's the connection between authority and truth. You see, lordship and discipleship reveal everything about your life and what you believe. Let me, let me say that again. Lordship and discipleship is revealed in everything in your life, and that reveals what you believe. Regardless of what you say or state in your, with your spouse, in your family, at church, at the office, or anywhere else. Your daily life choices and actions actually reveal that you have a Lord and that you are someone's disciple. Let me flip that around. Everything you believe and do in your life reveals who your Lord is and who you're a disciple of. The question is, do you really know who that is? Or maybe what that is? Now, in order to explain this further, let me give you uh, five words or concepts, and I'll have this little chart in the comments afterwards, so you can go back and look at this, and, and I ask you to pray about it and, and question in your own life, 
how am I living my life? Is it Have I fallen for the world, the enemies, the cultures, or even my own flesh? All of those sum up what the world says a word or a concept or a value is. All right? But the author, the one who's in authority, also says something about each of these. And it's really interesting how the enemy and our own flesh oftentimes has caused us to justify and rationalize what is not in line with the author's truth. So I've got just five words here. They're not all inclusive, but they are very instrumental in how we live our lives. I think when you go and look at them, when you hear me talk about them, and when you go to look at them, you're going to see that these five words really have a lot to do with how you're living your life. And we're going to start with the most common one, the one we talked about last week being the most important and the most confusing word. Well, it is the most important. I mean, it is the most confusing but it's not the most important because truth is the most important. We're going to find out why. First word is love. The world, the culture, the enemy, and my flesh, literally, and you'll know this as I say it, is, it, is that love is based on feelings. And we can sum it up with this one little phrase, if it feels good, do it. Which, by the way, has a... a, a what is what's that called? An, an, an ancillary, an opposite. It's got whatever that's called. Okay, it, it, it's got an opposite effect. If it doesn't feel good, quit it, drop it, don't do it. How does that work when you define love that way? You see, if everything's going well, then I must be in love. If she turns me on, if I, I like what she's doing for me, or or vice versa, I'm doing for her, and she's attracted me because I do nice things for her, and we're always feeling good. How long does that last? I'm going on 29 years of marriage, and I have an absolutely wonderful, beautiful wife. We haven't agreed on everything over those 29 years, plus the nearly three years that we were dating and engaged. But we learned this truth, and this is the truth from the author. Lust has feelings attached to it, good and bad. Who can make you feel the best in the world? Your spouse, your family, the people closest to you. Who can make you feel the worst in the world? Same people, right? Because you're closest to them. But that's not what love is. It, those are attached to it, but they do not define it. The author says this, that love is a commitment. It's a choice. It's an act of the will. And I'm going to go into these a little deeper as we go through this message here. But we've got to understand, feelings are associated with it. They do not define love. Love is defined by the commitment. I choose to love you regardless of what you do. That's what Jesus did for us. Second word is humility. We've talked about this some as well. Humility, how many of you have been humiliated? I wish I could see your hands right now. Go in the comments if you got it or whatever. How many have been humiliated in your life because of some poor, unwise, or prideful decision that you made? And then you had to be embarrassed, red-faced, humiliated by the outcome? Okay, keep your hand up. I can stay here for a while. How many of you have had to go back to that same lesson and be humiliated a second time? A third time? A fourth time? I, I could keep going all day. I could wear you out on this. You get the point. So what does the enemy say to the world and the world buys it? Oh, surely you don't want to be humiliated. And that's what humility is. Well, let me share something with you. Humility is not humiliation. Humility can be learned by humiliation, but there's another way you can learn humility, according to the author, because humility is actually being truly confident and content in who you are so you can choose to place others above you. See, that's the point of me choosing to take the low position because I know who I am. It's not prideful. It's just contentment. It's confidence to say, I will place you above me, and if you embarrass me, I'm not humiliated. I already knew who I was. Big difference. The enemy wants to see it as humiliation, and the Bible says that we ought to have humility in our lives. Again, we'll go a little deeper in just a moment. But it's not the humiliation. That's the world's idea of humility. It's actually being truly confident and content so you can choose to lift others above you. Mm -hmm. Third word is this. We talked about it a lot. We're going to hit it again. It's a lot about what we're saying here. Authority itself. Authority is, in the world's eyes, dictate, lord over, control. But according to the author, it's 
listen to what truth is saying. Listen to what the author is saying. And the author, Christ himself, truth himself said, has nothing to do with that. That's the way sinners, Gentiles, and believers do. Real authority is when you serve others, you place them above you in humility, and you lead by example. That's the truth about authority. Not just the authority that you look up to, but when you have authority in your life, when you're living it out. So you can choose to lord it over, but that's not really authority. It's when you serve and others are in need, guess what? They will invite you to have influence in their life. They just gave you authority. That's exactly what Jesus did. And he is the authority, right? He is the author. The fourth word is this, another one that ties into this. Again, if you, if you take some time to think about these, these words affect your life every single day. The fourth, fourth word or concept is this, integrity. How many of you passed second grade math? Oh, wait a minute. i got to back up a step. Coach John Wooden said this. Don't be concerned about your reputation because it's only what others think of you. But be very concerned about your character because it's who you really are. Well, go back and look at what we said about love. Commitment. I make the commitment regardless of what you do or say about me. Humility, I know who I am, so I choose to place you above me. Authority, I don't lord it over you. I choose to serve you, and if you need it, you invite me. If you don't invite me, that's okay. But if you desire that, you invite me to have that influence in your life. All of those are part of integrity because it's not about your reputation. See, in our world, and I can't tell you the number of people I've sat with, men in particular, but, but couples... In, in, in general, and the number of people when I talk to them about integrity, do you wish to be a man or a person of integrity? To a person, every one of them will say, oh yeah, do you think you are? Oh yes, I do. Then why are we having to talk about what you're hiding? Why do we have to talk about the secret sins? And here's the point I'm making with that. They have a reputation, that's why they hide the secret sins, so that the reputation continues to look good, but the character is actually rooted in the secret sin. So they're not integral. You know how I know that? Because integrity is not what others think of you, even if it looks great, and you get ahead doing it, which many people do in the world. Now back to my earlier question, how many of you passed second grade math? Thanks again. Those of you joining us, appreciate that. But here, here's why I asked that question. You all know this if you pass second grade math. What is an integer? And you're saying right now, oh, Greg, that's a whole number. And you would be right. You get 100% on this quiz, right? An integer is a whole number. Why do I use that word? Well, first of all, it's the same Greek root word that we get the word integrity from. In Latin and Greek, all, all of it's part of the, the older languages. Integer and integrity come from the same root word that begin and end with whole or wholeness. You see, an integer was a number that was whole in and of itself. It's not a partial or decimal or a fraction. It was whole. And someone with integrity is someone that's whole. It comes from the Hebrew concept of the word shalom. Many of you probably are immediately thinking, oh yeah, I've heard that before. It means peace. Yes, you want to know where that peace comes from? The Hebrew word shalom actually has 27 definitions affiliated with it. But the best one to describe it that brings them all together is the word completeness or wholeness. You want to have integrity in your life? You take the truth of the author and you apply it to every part of your life. You can have 99 parts of your life following that truth and one part walking another way. That's the one that will destroy you. You're not integral. Now, I'm not saying we're all to be perfect. I'm trying to give you the truth according to the author so you'll understand and won't be deceived and start walking in that one. You'll come back and say, wait a minute. I know that's not right. No matter how, much, how good it feels, no matter how much I like it or what I get out of it, it's not in line with the author. It's not in line with his truth. I want to be whole. I want to have that peace that comes from shalom and I only get that when I have that wholeness in every part of my life. If you want that peace, it, what you really are after is integrity. It's wholeness. That's the shalom. And the last word is discipleship, which the world says, and the enemy feeds this, you don't need a Lord. You're the master of your own ship. I talked about it last week. Captain of your own ship, master of your own fate. Okay? 
Sounds great. My flesh loves that. It's a lie. Okay? I love it. Why? Because my flesh would love to be captain and master and control everything. But I can't. I never will be able to. So i got to figure out which master I'm going to follow. I need to understand that. And the truth is that Jesus, the author, said, you do need a Lord. And I need to be it. And in reality, your flesh is going to battle that every step of the way. So I'm going to tell you the whole truth. And now it's your choice. Let me, once, once we do this chart, by the way, I get people start asking questions and, and, and making comments and being able to expose and allow things to be revealed in their life that in reality, they, many of them have been sitting in church all their life, but they've been living by the world's definitions. That's the way they've done their relationships. That's the way they've done their work and their money and everything else. So I'm not faulting them. I've done the same thing. They're loving according to feelings. They're, they're, they're humble, but it's really a false humility, only so it looks good so they can get out of it what they want. They practice authority by controlling rather than by serving. They, integrity as long as it looks good rather than whether or not that truth is applied to every part of their life. And so they're not really a disciple of the one who is the true authority. We need to understand that so that we can be under his truth and set free in that truth and their authority. Nobody argues or questions when I, when I show them this chart. Nobody questions the world's side. The, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's the world's definitions right there. Even when we don't want to, oftentimes we're walking in that. But we have been given the truth by God's word and by his spirit, and we can choose differently. That's the root of deception and sin. It started from the very beginning in Genesis. That's the way the enemy got Adam and Eve to do this. And so what is it? Let me take you a step further so I can show you this. Because when we follow his truth, it reveals that he's Lord in our life. When he is Lord, we choose to live by his truth. We can't claim him as Lord if we're living by another truth. Can I say that again? We can't claim Christ as Lord if we're living by another truth. That's why we need to be in the Word and know that. Then we can choose to follow him. And it's going to cost you something. I hate to be the one to bear bad news, but it's actually really good news. Because it's going to cost you everything that's not worth living for. So you can have everything that is worth living for. He's asking you to get rid of those very things that are going to destroy your life so you can have all that he promises. But you've got to make that choice. He won't force it, okay? This is true in Christ's life as well. I'm going to show you in several of these right here in the next few minutes why love is a commitment. Humility is confidence and contentment knowing who you are and so on. The first one, love is a commitment. That truth lies in Christ himself and in the cross. The greatest example, let me give you two of them. Matthew 26, 39, it says he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Going on a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, I'm not feeling good right here. Now, I added that to make my point. I don't like what I'm getting ready to have to go through. So if it's possible, will you take this cup away from me? Yet, not my will but your will be done. Jesus had a choice. He was asking the Father if there's a way to down this. He even goes further on, just a little further in the same chapter, in verse 53. It says, when Peter cuts off the ear of the, of the uh, centurion, the Roman guard, Jesus said, don't you think that I could call on my Father and have it at my will at once he would dispose 12 legions of angels? Not only did he have a choice, but he could have prayed and said, okay, this is getting too tough. It doesn't feel good. I don't like this. And, and since we're the authors and love is a feeling, I, I'm out of here. He's basically saying that. He's saying, I could call 72,000, a legion of 6,000. I could call 72,000 angels to take me out of the situation at any point in time. I have a choice, but I'm remaining committed. Let's take it on further. Just a few verses further in Matthew 26, verse 56. Every one of his closest friends abandoned him. How do you think he felt relationally? This is not feeling good. Must not be love. Let's quit. In the next chapter, Matthew 27, 22 and 23, how do you think he felt socially? The entire mob 
who had just four days before put palm branches and coats and cloaks in front of him and hailed him as the Messiah, as the king of the universe, are now crying, crucify him. I don't know about you, but that didn't feel too good to me. How do you think he felt mentally and emotionally? In the garden itself, he had sweat drops of blood. There's a medical term that actually when we get in so much anguish, it causes our smaller capillaries to burst and blood comes out with our sweat. It takes a lot of anguish to do that. So how do you think he was feeling? Let's go on. Physically, crucifixion, beat upon, spit upon, beard pulled out, hair pulled out, mocked, humiliated, flogged, and crucified. I don't think he felt very good physically. And then finally, in, Matthew, in Mark 15, 34, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Spiritually, in, in, in every way possible, the author of the universe felt horrible. If the author said that love was a feeling, why did he stay? Because love's not a feeling. And we need to remember that in our marriages, with our children, with our friends, and even with our enemies. When he says love your enemies, he's not saying feel good about them. He's saying remain committed to them. Remain committed to what is best for them. And that's my truth, my gospel, my salvation. That's what love does. If love were a feeling, as our culture predominantly defines and lives it today, in nearly every situation, then Jesus, the author, would have said, nope, love's a feeling, Dad. We defined it, and it's a feeling, so send those 72,000 angels, I'm out of here. He showed us that love was the commitment by keeping it, and he showed us by obeying and loving his Father first and then staying on the cross for us. That's what love is. In Luke 23, 34, in the worst time of that situation, he cries out to his father and says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Wow. You see, love is a choice. It's a commitment. It's an act of the will for the sake of others. That's the author's truth and example. The second is humility, true confidence and contentment. I once read a tweet from a prominent author pastor that said humility is not thinking less of yourself it's not thinking of yourself at all echoing a very common cultural misconception and it sounds so good but you know what we weren't designed not to think of ourselves at all so that's not going to work actually the word tells us i'm going to give you three scriptures here in scripture and from christ himself that tells us that humility is actually knowing who you are so you can choose to place others above you. In Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine, 39, Jesus said in the greatest commandments, and when he's answering that question, he says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. How, how can I give of myself to my neighbor when I don't even care about myself? That's part of the problem in most of our relationships today. We don't teach people how to love God first and how to love who we are, and then we say, go love others. It requires humility. And, and, and I might get humiliated, but it doesn't bother me if I know who I am. Second one is Romans 12, 3. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to, because that's pride. But do think of yourself with sober or clear judgment and thinking according to the measure of faith that God has given you. God's given you faith so that you can know who you are. But the only way you're going to find that out is if you go back to the author who gave you that faith. That's when you know who you are, you can humble yourself and serve and love others. And then Jesus himself in John 13, 1 through 5, showed them love, washed their feet. In the middle of that, in verse 3, it says this, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So what's he do? Knowing who he is with all authority, takes off his robe and bows down and washes feet. That's, that's humility. He knows who he is. Finally, in a humility, God is an opponent of, to the proud, but a teammate of the humble. I'm using athletic terms because of a former for ex-athlete, the former coach, okay? X, X, X athletes getting farther down the road all the time, all right? But think about it. James 4, 6 says God opposes. He's on the other team. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You're on my team. Do you know who you are? You can if you're following the author, but you can't do it the world's way and claim you're doing it his way. The third one is authority. We've already talked about this several times, but clearly it's this. He said, no, no, no. It's not lording it over. It's bowing down and serving. Matthew 20, 20 through 28. Go look at that. 
It's very clear that Jesus says, you want real authority. It has nothing to do with you telling others what to do. It's everything with you serving them. When you do that, you put yourself in a position of authority. The fourth word was integrity. It's another very interesting term. I've talked about not being concerned with your reputation, but your, but your, uh, but your um, character. And that character has to be rooted in wholeness, in the shalom, the Hebrew word of peace. And I find my peace when my whole being is at one with his truth. That, that's what we're looking for. Everybody wants that peace, and that's what integrity brings you when you do it God's way, the author's way, not the world's way. And finally, we come to discipleship. This is crucial in grasping lordship as it defines our response to his authority to his truth, to his lordship. How are we living that out? It's just as profound, if not more so, that we understand the enemy's use of this in our lives. So simply put, the enemy in the world deceives us into thinking, you don't need a Lord. You got this. And Jesus says, no, you do need one, as I mentioned earlier. And I need to be it, and your flesh is not going to like it. You're going to have to think about that. You're going to have to make the choice. I won't force it. That's what it means to be a disciple. I trust that you're, you're getting the message with these, and you'll take some time to go into the comments and look at these and our articles back at www.loveandworship.com and how we've compromised so much of this in our culture, our lives, our relationship, and even in our churches so that we talk about discipleship, but we're not really living it out in many cases. We've got to find out what the author says and what his truth is and then walk in it if he's Lord and we're his disciples. He's very clear in his word. So we're going to continue talking about that as we wrap up this series next week and begin to move through this in discipleship and beyond. Share your comments, your questions. Ask your questions. We'll, we'll respond. We'll do it privately in a message to me if you want to. Or go to email, loveandlordship at gmail.com. Or you can text me, 859-229-6504. Either one of those, all three of those, you can do that. Share all of that. We'd love to hear from you. I'll have all the scriptures in comments, you can get the full articles, podcasts, videos, again, at loveandwordship.com. Check it out. At Love and Worship, we're here to help you live fulfilling lives and healthy relationships in the love and worship of Jesus Christ. No charge for what we do with our counseling or mentoring or teaching. We simply rely on the generosity of others, and we ask you, even at this time, if the Lord is leading you, give to us, to some other ministry or somewhere, but if you can't, then make sure you're wise in what you're doing with what he has provided for you. And if we can help you, let us know. Okay? Appreciate that. Please continue to pray for us. We thank you for any prayers and for any gifts. Thank you. The Lord is leading this, and he is providing. So you can check all this out, as I said, at loveandworship.com. We desire to make disciples who make disciples in his love and worship in every home, in every church. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for your prayers. Thanks always to the Lord. Make it a great day, and God bless in Christ.